This meeting is being recorded. Okay, everybody, I just want to welcome you to another one of our Año Nuevo enrichments. And uh, welcome to all Año Nuevo. I did send it out to some of the other parks in the district who might be in, uh, interested. So it looks like we have a good crowd. And Sharon, do you prefer uh, questions at the end or I can collect them in the middle or what would you like? Um, it doesn't matter. I think my only challenge is I can't see you guys since I have the slide up. Um, so if you want to interrupt me, that's fine. <laughs> that might be. Yeah, I mean, if there's a place uh, that you slow down or stop, maybe I'll say something. Otherwise, we're all patient and we can wait for the end. Everybody, you're welcome to put any questions kind of at the whole piece in chat, and we will make sure I will be reading those as we go along. So if you have a question um, and I see it in chat and I think maybe Sharon should answer it, I might interrupt or something, Sharon, and let you know. So, uh, but otherwise, we'll hold our questions till the end. So, okay, that sounds great. Give a nice welcome to Sharon Mellon and um, enjoy, everybody. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Susan, for inviting me. I really enjoy giving talks to volunteers and docents, and I love talking about sea lions, so, um, so I really am, am pleased to be here. Um, and I just wanted to, a little background for me. Uh, I work with, the, with NOAA for the National Marine Fisheries Service, Alaska Fisheries Science Center. I'm based in Seattle, but I have spent more than 35 years working on California sea lions in the Channel Islands, uh, mainly at San Miguel Island. So um, they are by far, well, I guess they're my favorite um, uh, marine mammal, but I do work on other species too. So I, I'm always pleased to talk about them. Um, and I wanted to just point out, um, I, I was going to kind of focus this, I know you guys are, are mostly interested in Año Nuevo. Uh, most of what I'm going to be talking about is much more general, but most of what I'm going to be saying, um, I hope will lead to questions that you have about the animals that spend their time there in Año. Um, and I wanted to start with a little bit of background on California sea lions. Um, specifically that um, they, they are a really remarkable recovery um, story. They were heavily harvested like a lot of marine mammals in the, in the 19th and 20, early 20th centuries. Um, and they were mainly, they really didn't have much to offer except to be uh, killed for fish bait and, uh, and other things. They weren't harvested for their fur or their blubber or anything. Um, and they had a lot of bounties on them for competing with fisheries. So when they became protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, they started recovering pretty quickly and they went from about 48,000 animals um, in the U.S. population in 1972 to over 250,000 in 2014. So it's been a very remarkable um, story. And one of, uh, one of the reasons for that is that they spent a lot of time in the California current. Part of what makes them so special is that they, they have a lot of really great characteristics when you're trying to study a ecosystem and the health of an ecosystem. It's great to have an animal that, that's easy to observe and that can tell you a lot about the system without you having to go out and measure all those different things about how much prey is out there and how warm it is and all those kind of questions. Um, and as a top predator, um, they kind of assimilate all of that information about their ecosystem. Um, they are also uh, abundant, they're wide ranging, they're coastal, um, all which um, helps them tell us more about our environment in the ocean because we also tend to um, use the coastal ocean more than we use the offshore areas. They eat the same things we eat. They're sensitive to changes in the environment, um, particularly warming of the ocean. And they're also susceptible to diseases and contaminants that, are, um, that run off from our mainland into the ocean. So for all those reasons, they are a great indicator of ecosystem health of the California current. And in 2000, they were, um, they were designated as a sentinel of ocean health for the California current system. And since then, they've only become more valuable in that role. Sharon, we're still seeing yes. the first slide, so I don't know if you've clicked on the oh. second slide yet, but you, um, the first, the first slide is the one that's uh, mainly, so you can see on your screen, maybe it's uh, kind of outlined in red on the left, so if you can use your mouse or your arrow buttons to click down. I tried the mouse, that didn't seem to work. How about this? Did that help? No, maybe try, um, hmm. It's just uh, having some problems. 
Um, go back to from beginning or from current slide and try that again. I, um, you can also use the, I see the slide bars next to all of your uh, slides and maybe you can click on and hold on those slide bars and just move it down. Uh, question, Jeff. Well, Jeff will ask. Click that. on slide number two. What's so special on the left hand side? Click on that slide. Yeah, we're, and I think oh, she's yeah. trying that. And for some reason, hers is stuck. We're just having a little Zoom. This is the third Zoom today that we've had trouble, I've had trouble with. So I'm wondering if it's a, a system wide thing. Yeah, but are you awesome. not able to click on the other slide, Sharon? Uh, I just did, but you said it didn't change, huh? It so did not still... change on our view, yeah, unless it did for anybody else. So um, it says slide two of two, or slide one, and now it says I'm on slide two, but you guys aren't seeing that, huh? We're not seeing that so far. It's just we're seeing that beautiful picture of the sea lions all <laughs> in the boat. Oh, dear. On the left, we can see where your next slide was coming up, but we haven't been able to see you click on to that one. So um, let's, let me try this. No? Uh, wow. Well, I don't, maybe I can do this. Is it getting bigger? Nope. We had well, it once a while ago. There was something that you did that made it work. And whether it was from present. Oh, it did? OK, I guess I missed you telling me that. So now I'm still OK. Well, so that, was a, that was a while ago. So but it just makes me think that we can do it. Um, we are seeing your screen. We can see those. It's just not moving down. Um, you can try refreshing your screen. Um, did that help? No. I, can't, I can't actually see what you guys can see, so I'm a little bit uh yes and one of our docents says even if we can't see your picture we're loving what you're saying your talk is <laughs> riveting so if, even if well, we can see all the pictures we'll be able idea. to <laughs> but uh, i know it'd be nice to see the different maps and such um so uh let's see there's got to be something i'm doing wrong yeah. here Someone is asking, Mark, we had it on presenter review before and it didn't necessarily work, but um, Sharon, if you want to go back up there where it says use presenter view again above, um, it's in the little white, the kind of grayed out bar in the middle under the word acrobat. Uh, it says use presenter view. You click that once, maybe try clicking it one more time um, and see if that gets us back to where we were before. Otherwise, maybe um, you can look at your slides and um, just tell us the story and we'll look at your face. And we'll be happy with that because so far you're, you're, uh, we're already pretty interested in the story. How about, uh, is there any way that I could, could I send you the presentation and you could do it, do you think? Um, you could, let's try that. Let's see okay. if that works. It's hard to send a um, presentation in the email, but maybe through some Google Drive or something, you can do that. While we're playing around with that, maybe you can, uh, once you send that, you could maybe just keep talking while I see if I can get it up on mine. Okay, and none of what I'm, I'm still messing with stuff, but you guys still aren't, it's not improving anything that you guys no. are. Uh -uh. Okay. How about now? No. Um, I was like, bigger on mine. Um, but I'm not going forward though. You're still only seeing the sea lions on the boat. Yep. Yep. It's not switching. Usually that's, you know, just clicking on the slide with your um, <laughs> mouse and doing the left click with your mouse to do it. So it's very interesting that it's not. But yes, if you can send it to me, go for it so that. Uh, Okay, hold on just a second. Uh, now I'm sort of trapped. Oh, that did it. Now we're on uh, we're on number three. So whatever you did, we're on number three. So that's perfect. Now we're but on number two. Woohoo! You figured it. Okay, but are you seeing like the orange banner and the whole 
You're actually seeing yeah, it. Yeah, we're seeing it all, but that's oh, perfectly fine. I'm so sorry. Let me let's see. Just go with, let's go with this, okay? That's beautiful. Okay. Um, so what's so special right. about California sea lions? Let's start with <laughs> that. Oh, well, everything. Um, all right. Uh, so let me back up a little bit. So um, part of what makes them such a great uh, indicator of the California current is that they're a top predator. So they assimilate everything in the ecosystem that's below them. So they assimilate contaminants, they assimilate um, prey, different characteristics of prey, they assimilate, um, they, they represent in sort of a lot of their biology, when things are out of whack, they represent all of that. Um, so it makes them really good indicators of ecosystem health. And in 2000, uh, I think as I said earlier, they were designated as a sentinel of ocean health for the California current ecosystem. Um, and for lots of good reasons, which I'll go into here um, as we keep moving through. So uh, this is the breeding range of California sea lions. Um, well, actually, sorry, it's the, it's the entire range of California sea lions. And the red circles represent where they breed. So primarily in the California Channel Islands and all of the offshore islands of California, as well as in the Gulf of California. Um, they range all the way up to Southeast Alaska, but that's primarily the males, which are indicated there by kind of the single hatch marks. And the females really only go up to about the Farallons um, and down south, a little bit farther into central Mexico, um, because they're tied to the islands because of their pups. So uh, they can't travel as far, and they're indicated there in the crosshatch. Most of the population breeds on the California Channel Islands. Um, San Miguel and San Nicolas Islands make up 90% of the total population. So that's where we focus a lot of our research because that's where the bulk of the population is and that's where we can get the best indication of what's going on with the population. Um, smaller populations are at Santa Barbara and San Clemente and of course at Año Nuevo and the Farallons. There are also small numbers of animals that are breeding there now and that's a Fairly recent. They've been they've been breeding there since the mid 1990s. So early on, when the population was first protected in the 70s, it was pretty much isolated down in the Channel Islands. And as it's grown, it has colonized or recolonized and colonized um, new areas. So what's so special about the California Islands? Um, a lot of this has to do with where they're located in relation to the eastern boundary of the California current system. It's an incredibly productive um, ecosystem that supports large numbers of land breeding marine mammals, but also lots of cetaceans and seabirds and all kinds of stuff. And this is a very unique aspect of how close this current comes to the coast. So most of the time boundary currents are a little bit more offshore, but this one actually runs pretty close to the coast, which allows a lot of animals to take advantage of it and a coastal animal like California, sea lions in particular. It also creates cold ambient temperatures year round on most of these islands. They have lots of fog, which you guys are probably well aware of um, in Monterey Bay and your area there. Um, and that creates a perfect environment for them to raise their young. They don't have to worry about heat. Um, they will, pups will actually die from heat prostration if it gets too warm. So it's really important that they have that cold ambient temperature as well as cold water around the areas. They have access to predictable food um, because there's almost always something spawning um, nearby because of the incredible productivity of the current. Um, there are no predators on most of these islands that are significant um, for pups or for adults. And then finally, except of course in the water, which I'll talk to in a little bit. And then finally, there's no real human disturbance on most of the places where they breed, they're pretty isolated and, and that allows them to have that buffer between their breeding time and human disturbance. California sea lions are polygonous like many of the uh, pinnipeds. One male breeds with uh, several females. In this photo here, you can see the, um, the adult male is the big chestnut male here with a uh, sagittal crest, makes him very, dis very distinct. He's about three times the size of the females. The females are the light blonde or sometimes tan colored animals and they weigh about 250 pounds, so they're quite a bit smaller than the males, which are in at about a thousand when they're breeding. And in the foreground here are the pups. They're born black, but they change to kind of a brownish color after a couple of, usually about a month or so. Um, and that's because their fur oxidizes once they are out in the, um, in the air. So I'm gonna walk you through the different uh, kind of significant stages of their life history. 
Um, and we'll start with the pups. Um, they're born over a six week period from late May to the end of June. Um, they're completely dependent on their mother's milk for nutrition until they're about six months old. And they begin, they don't swim when they're first born. It takes them about eight weeks to develop swimming skills and they're not very good even then, but they do improve over a number of months. And they begin feeding on their own about six or seven months, but they're still nursing. So they're kind of supplementing their milk diet. Um, they don't travel with their mother and they don't learn to feed from their mother. They have to kind of, once they're weaned at about 11 months old, they're on their own. They got to figure it out. And mostly what they do is they hook up with other animals and they follow groups of animals out to where older animals and juveniles forage. And that's how they learn how to feed. Um, the pup survival is, is anywhere from 35% to 75% in a, in a year. Depends a lot on what the conditions are for adult females when they're, um, when they're pregnant, as well as when they're nursing their pups, and also whether or not um, pups get exposed to starvation or disease. Starvation typically is because the female goes out on a foraging trip and can't find the pup when she returns, and disease is all kinds of things, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Now we move on to the juvenile life stage. And once they're weaned, their first year survival is, is not great, but it's also not really bad. Um, it's around 60 to 80%, again, dependent a lot on the environmental conditions that they're weaned into. So if conditions are really bad in June or July of the year that they're weaned, um, they can really struggle to survive. Um, if they are weaned into good conditions, um, they usually have pretty good survival. And just for you guys at Onion Nuevo Island, one of the really interesting things is it, uh, it has about 66% per, of the yearling sea lions that show up at Año are males. There's a, a big segregation of sexes that use uh, Onion Nuevo when they're yearlings. And then as they get older, the males kind of travel farther north as they age. And the females remain closer to their rookeries, even as juveniles. And eventually they spend their time there as adult females. If the animals make it to two, they have really good survival, about 95%, and they stay at that percentage for quite some time until they get into their teens. Primary causes for mortality for juveniles are predation by sharks and killer whales and interactions with humans, primarily in, in nets and, um, and packing bands and things like that in the ocean, as well as some diseases that are specific to juveniles. So Sharon, and there's a question about what makes it poor, what makes the condition poor? Yeah, generally for California sea lions, typically the poor conditions are when it's warm. So when we have El Nino conditions or when we had the big marine heat wave in 2014 and 2015, that created basically a desert for foraging for them. Um, and it created a lot of mortality. We even had an unusual mortality event during those years where we had huge numbers of animals stranding and dying out at the rookeries as well. And that had the greatest impact on juveniles and pups because they're the two age classes that can't travel very far yet. They're still not really accomplished for diving and traveling long distances. And so they're the groups that get impacted the most when prey gets really dispersed or it's really hard for them to find. It doesn't impact the adults nearly as much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we move on to adult females. Um, they become reproductive at four or five years old, um, but most of them don't really reproduce until they're six and they're all reproducing by the time they're seven. So they have kind of a long period where they're just being juveniles and kind of learning how to be a sea lion. They, reduce, they may reproduce every year, um, but a lot of them don't. Their, their reproductive cycle is very intense. As I mentioned earlier, um, they, they have their pup and then they're with it for almost a full year. So if they have a pup again, then they only get like a couple weeks break before they're producing another pup and having to uh, support lactation for a whole nother year. So they oftentimes will take a break. Um, about 77% of them will give birth in each year. And that changes dramatically also with environmental conditions. So in a bad year, like an El Nino, you'll be down more like only 50% of them will give birth to a pup. And a lot of them in those conditions will choose to nurse their pup from the previous year into the new year to give it a better chance of survival. Um, they only give birth to one pup. There's no adoption and there's no twinning. We've never documented that. Um, when females, once they give birth to the pup, they stay with it for about five days and do a bunch of bonding. They like to have a little bit of space. They isolate themselves like this female has in this picture. And then 
once they do that five days or so, then they start off on their foraging cycle and they go out for four to five, well, really early on it's two days and then it goes up to four days as the pup gets older. And then they come back and they nurse the pup for one or two days. So it's really important that they have that bonding time with the pup because once they leave and go out on that first foraging trip, the real trick is when they come back, if they're gonna be able to find it. And it's in a sea of hundreds of pups that look exactly the same. Um, and when she returns, they're all running up to her and trying to convince her that they're hers. Um, and so she recognizes her pup by vocalization, which is unique to every female and every pup she has. So no two pups of hers have the same vocalization. And then they also have a unique scent and she identifies them by both of those things before she'll accept the pup. Um, lifespan of females, we know basically from our marking studies, um, my oldest female has been 25 years old in the wild. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they could live a little longer, um, but they pretty much slow down their reproductive um, output when they're about 17 years old. Um, they get less, they have fewer and fewer pups the older they get. And then finally the males. Um, so this is mostly what you guys have at Anyo, although you do see females around, but these are the big boys that spend a lot of time hanging on your boats and your docks and your buoys and barking and making bad smells. Um, but they're really great. They're, I really love the males, they're really fun. Um, and they can reproduce about four to five years, um, but most of them don't because they have to develop both physical and social maturity in order to work in the system that sea lions have for reproduction. And physical maturity um, takes quite a while till they're about 12 years old. They have to bulk up to about a thousand pounds. They have to develop the secondary sexual characteristics of the little top knot that's they're so well known for. The male in here, you can see his little blonde spot on his head. Um, and then they also have to have social maturity. Um, they have to get the aggressiveness to actually fight, which a lot of them don't. Some of them remain idle their entire life. They don't ever hold territory. Um, they also have to have good communication skills with the females. So the females are the ones that do most of the mate choice in California sea lions. And so the males have to know how to kind of woo them um, to, to get their attention and to allow them to be bred. And the other thing I really love about the males in this picture is the pup that's on his back. Um, they're very gentle with the pups. They don't really have a paternal role per se, but they are very aware of the pups and they often will kind of protect the pups a little bit from big surf and other things like that, which is very unique to California sea lions. Um, and then finally, only 10% of the males that make it to, uh, that are born actually make it to reproductive age. So they, they have a much lower survival rate than the females. And my oldest male um, from our marking studies is 19 years old. And then just a little bit more males that you guys wouldn't see at Anyo. Um, this is San Miguel Island where I do all of my work. And this is my study area below my blind. And the green lines, I hope you can see those, um, are representing kind of the different sort of habitats that the males are defending. So in the, in the water's edge there, you can see all these individual males with no females. There's just individual males there and they're guarding their territory. And they have the prime territory because they have access to water, which is what the females need to stay cool. It's what the pups need to learn how to swim. So they have the best territories. They usually get most of the copulations. And then as you move inland in each of these bands, you kind of see um, kind of different groups of males with different success. But the other important thing about sea lions is that they tend, the females kind of dominate the system. So they move up and down the beach during the day with the heat. So in the morning, they're gonna be inland pretty high. And so the males that are up inland, they get a chance in the morning to copulate. And then as the day gets warmer, the females kind of march down the beach with their pups and all those males in each of those bands, males get a different chance each time the females are moving um, with the environment. So it's it's a really cool thing to watch when you're when you're sitting there. It's you can almost time it every day with the females making this movement. And the males don't move, just the females do. So the males hold their territory and they hope that the females will kind of walk into the territory. The other thing about the males for California sea lions that is unique is that they hold territory for many years in a row. Um, sometimes as many as six or seven, depending on where they're holding their territory. And that's because they don't stay on territory the entire season. They stay on for several weeks and then they go off and they feed and then they come back and they try to reclaim their territory. And sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not. Um, but if they are, um, then they can continue to 
they don't really get that physical exhaustion that elephant seals and some of the other species get by fasting the entire, you know, two or three month breeding season. All right, so I'll stop there and see, do you guys have any questions on kind of that phase before I move into numbers and how many there are and stuff like that? Thank you. I um, have a question and if anybody else uh, write it in chat um, and it's about on your way, but we did get a question um, about on your way before. So two questions. They never used to breed there and they are now. You may have answered that in that with their expansion, but you also just mentioned you don't see this lines, these bands um, kind of set up at Anyo. And why is that? Yeah, so the answer to the first one is yes, that's it's largely a population expansion that has brought them to Anyo. It probably also has a bit to do with changes maybe in the prey resources around Anyo. Um, you know, it's not a stagnant environment. And so really these animals largely determine where they hang out based on where the food is. Um, so not knowing that much about, you know, 1920s or 1930s around Anyo or even the 1800s, um, it's hard to know whether, you know, whether the reason that they're there is solely related to the population expansion. It probably has also a lot to do with um, sort of changes in the ecosystem that made Monterey Bay and that area very productive. Um, but it, but we certainly, in the early 1990s, um, mostly what was at Año Nuevo was juveniles. And one thing I didn't mention is when they colonize a new area, typically what they do is the juveniles show up first, and this is pretty characteristic of mammals in general. They show up and they start hanging out and they just goof around and then they do that for several years. And then pretty soon they get old enough and now they've decided this is kind of a place they like and so they start maturing and then they start staying there and then they become adults and they start breeding there. And so that, that colonization process can take between, oh, you know, three to seven years to take place. And so at Anya, when we first started monitoring there in the early nineties, it was all juveniles. Um, and then over the years, it has slowly become a mature colony. It's still not a huge colony, but you guys have, you know, several hundred pups born there sometimes. So it's, it's an established colony now. Um, and then the other question about the bands, that has a lot to do with just at San Miguel, what's very unusual about it is, it's, as you can see here, it's a giant sandy beach. Um, and so there's no physical markers to kind of, for males to use to contain the females. Um, they just have to kind of accept that the females are going to move around. Places like Anyo that are rocky um, or maybe even have lots of elephant seals mixed in, those things provide kind of barriers to movement of the females and that allows them to have kind of more of a traditional territorial kind of system set up. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I believe that uh, helps to answer the, the question on there. Um, and two other questions. One was a little more clarification on the when the reproductive season is, like when they mate and such. And then I can ask the next question. But first, a little bit more on the reproductive season and cycle. Sure. Um, they breed, so they, we consider their reproductive year starts in mid-May, around May 15th to May 20th. And generally females um, will kind of already be on the, the beaches. They'll already kind of be wandering around. Um, and then they give birth and that, that birthing period lasts over six weeks. So females will be arriving during that whole time and they'll be giving birth. And the peak is around June 15th. So we call kind of median birth date, we say is June 15th, cause that's when the majority of females um, have given birth, but there'll still be females giving birth all the way to the end of June. So that's kind of the pupping season. And then they have a 30 day postpartum estrus. So they are bred 30 days after they have given birth. And that's when the males really show up. They show up kind of in mid June to late June because they know that's when their reproductive opportunities are gonna happen, right? Females have to be in estrus. Um, so the breeding takes place for like another six weeks. So now we're into August. And then the males will leave and migrate northward. Um, usually showing up at Anyo and then kind of moving their way on up the coast all the way to Southeast Alaska. And the females um, will stay around the islands pretty much the whole year and the juveniles and some of the non-reproductive females too. They'll all just kind of stay around the island for the rest of the year. And then for the pups, they wean about a year after about 11 months actually from the time that they're born. So they're there with their moms that whole year till about, usually it's April, late April, early May. 
And that also is timed really well with the stranding season because typically the stranding numbers really jump up in that kind of May, June, July period. And that's because you're getting all the animals that have weaned and then really couldn't make it on their own. Let's see, did I cover, did I cover all the different um, yeah, important stuff there? And that. lactation is 11, is 11 months too. So females are lactating the whole time they're with their pup. And it's a, it's a gradual wean, we call it, where the eventually the pup will either decide not to return back with the mother to see its mother, or the mother will take a vacation. And that's how they break their weaning bond. Great, thank you. Um, and there's two other questions. One, um, and I think I mentioned this when you and I were emailing, is that we, we have a lot of questions about why they're not on the mainland. And if they are, traditionally we have been told, and it seems to bear out that if you see a sea lion on the mainland when we're out there interpreting about elephant seals, it's most likely that sea lion is gonna die. So we see a lot of dead sea lions and we're wondering why, is it just the current takes them up there? Why do they come to die over here and not on the island? Why so many dead sea lions and why don't the living ones come and populate this place? That's a great question. Um, well, two things. One is that um, California sea lions, just throughout all of the history that we know about them, they have always chosen to breed and haul out on unpopulated islands with no predators. Um, so that's part of the reason I think that they don't show up on the mainland for Anyo, uh, you know, the, the main beaches you have there, um, because that, that would put them, you know, back and you've got to kind of think back to how the stuff evolved, right? Back into the 18th century and 19th century when things weren't developed, there were bears and wolves and coyotes and other things running around and sea lion pups, all these pinniped pups actually, but sea lion pups particularly are really, really vulnerable when they're young. Like I said, they can't swim when they first are born. So it's just a safety kind of mechanism to, to be someplace where there is no, they're really vulnerable when they're, when they're breeding. So I think that's the main reason. They do certainly colonize some coastal areas like Cape San Martin, just south of you guys. There are pups being born there, but that's a really cliffy, very protected kind of beach where I think it would be hard for a predator to surprise them. So I think that's why that works. Um, and then, and then your, let's see, your other question was um, about why there's so many dead ones. And we don't see very many dead ones on San Miguel. Um, we think that the majority of animals die at sea and it probably does have a lot to do with the currents um, around Año and kind of um, the coastal currents that are moving through there is probably just a place where they end up being washed up. I would, I would guess, much like we think at San Miguel, the ones that we do see probably died nearby. So they, you know, they probably weren't like they're not being carried all the way from San Miguel, for example, up to Año, but they probably died in the water somewhere around there, and then they're just getting washed in onto your beaches. It's also true that when you see the kind of individual animal by itself on a beach, that's really unusual for sea lions, and we generally assume that they're sick. Um, and they're probably looking for a place to just kind of chill for a while, maybe to die, um, but they don't tend to do that unless they're not healthy. And is that sickness usually like the demoic poisoning or pollution or what gets them so sick? Because we do see ones that look pretty sick coming up. Yeah, um, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. If you want me to keep going, I can, um, I have yeah, a bunch of stuff. Let's, let's keep going. I do want to acknowledge one more, and you and I talked about it. Uh, we do have a request to talk a little bit about the difference between California and sellers. And I know you said you would be doing that toward the end. So uh, I knew the question would come up. So um, I'm sure we'll hear from you later about both those things, sickness and sure. sellers. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's talk a little bit about just general numbers and how we know how many there are. Um, so we do um, annual counts of live and dead pups every year. We do them with aerial surveys or ground counts. And then we also, the reason I knew how old animals are and things like that is because of marking programs that we have. We have both branded and tagged animals. You guys may have seen some of them. 
Um, and that allows us to get the age and sex information on individuals over their lifetime. Once we mark them like that, we can keep track of them and get survival rates, which we need in order to estimate the total population size. So these two pieces of information we put into models and that helps us determine how many there are. So uh, the most recent estimate we have, we're working on a new one, it takes us a while to get all the data. Um, I hope you guys can see, this might be awfully small, but um, I'll just point out that this is a, a model that we have that estimates the number of sea lions in any given year. And it's a combination of our survival rates and our pup censuses. This particular one is from the very beginning of our monitoring program in 1975, all the way to the recent data that we had in 2014. And we had a population estimate of 257,631 animals. So if you remember when I first started talking way back here in 1975, we were looking at a population of about 48,000. Um, here it's a little bit bigger, I guess it was closer to, that was in 1972. So in 1975, it was closer to 60,000. Um, so that's quite an interesting trajectory and it grew pretty fast. Um, but you can also see a few places where it dipped pretty severely, and those are um, relative to El Ninos um, and a little bit of heat wave in, um, in the more recent years. And, and the other thing I wanted to point out too is that since 2010, the population growth has slowed pretty considerably. It's only growing at about 1% a year, which is a lot slower than it was, it was about 5% up until then. Things that affect population growth. This is where we're gonna talk about disease and other things that you guys might experience when things wash up on your beach. There are the natural regulators like competition for resources and ocean events, um, diseases, which we'll talk about a little bit more in predation. Um, and then there's also the human interactions. Um, mainly this is in the form of contaminants that affect reproduction and survival. So an indirect kind of effect and then fishery interactions. So competition for space, I'll just move through this pretty quickly. This is San Miguel Island again. Um, you can see that California sea lions here have to share their space, their breeding space with northern fur seals and elephant seals. Um, but there's plenty of space and it seems to work out because they all have kind of different times that they use it for their most sensitive periods. So space really isn't an issue and it's unlikely to control the population. And then we also have competition for food, which is a more likely um, place where we might think they would have problems. They do overlap pretty substantially with, with northern fur seals um, in terms of what they like to eat, but the two species feed in different zones of the ocean. So California sea lions feed mainly coastally, a little bit offshore, whereas northern fur seals feed way offshore, even though they feed on roughly the same things. They also feed at different depths. So they, they stratify their environment both by where they're feeding geographically, but also in the depth zone. And then northern elephant seals really don't count because they're pelagic and they don't even eat when they're around um, when they're around the breeding colonies. So they're not really a factor in terms of competition for food. So it's more likely that it, rather than competing with another species, they're going to be limited by their own competition as the population grows. And the way that California sea lions deal with this is they segregate their foraging areas by age and sex classes. So these are some studies that have come out um, from folks there at UC Santa Cruz and some of our folks. Um, on the left here is the distribution of adult females that are lactating. These animals were instrumented at San Miguel and San Nicolas. But I think you can see pretty clearly here that they spend most of their time coastally or around the islands. But I wanna point out the blue dots, which are um, in 2005, which was a very warm year. And you can see that their distribution shifted offshore in that year. And that's because that's where the food went. Um, and then on the right-hand side, and I know this is probably really small for you guys, um, given that you don't have the full screen, but uh, these are the adult males. And this is from a study we did in the 90s and early 2000s. We had satellite instruments on adult males. And we instrumented them up in Washington and then they traveled down to the islands for breeding. And the lighter blue circles that you see there are what we call their rest stops. And they have lots of areas where the males kind of stop off and rest and feed and they might spend a couple of days and then they keep on moving down their migration track. But you can also notice that they also stay pretty coastal but they're migratory. So they're not there year round, whereas the females are in this area all the time, all year. 
And then this is a study that was done at Anyo by Mike Weiss um, a number of years ago. And I just wanted to show you this because it's kind of interesting. Um, these are males, adult and subadult males. And in a cool or what we call a normal water year, you can see they have that coastal distribution. They wander down to the Channel Islands and they go all the way up to Southern Oregon. But in the warm water years, they stayed primarily in California and they went much farther offshore. So again, this is just representing how prey is really driving a lot of the um, a lot of their ability to get food, and that then affects their ability to um, survive. So warmer ocean conditions impact them primarily by reducing the prey that's available to individual animals. So a lot of the animals you guys are seeing washing up are likely animals that have been starving. And that can either be because of sea surface temperatures that are really warm that have caused kind of a redistribution of their prey. And that tends to mainly affect pups and yearlings and juveniles. Adults can usually weather it a little bit better. And an interesting note here is just that climate models predict a two degree increase in sea surface temperatures by 2050. But we know that anything above 1.5 has pretty dramatic effects on sea lions. So it doesn't really bode well for them um, into the future. And the other interesting part of this is that we can predict stranding numbers based on pup growth. So we measure pup growth um, in October and then again in February every year. And this is just a graph to show you the relationship between kind of different years when the growth rates are really low for the pups right before they wean and years when they're normal. So if you just look at on the bottom axis there are the female daily growth rates, kilograms per day. And over on the right hand side is kind of normal, 0 0.8 or 0 0.08, sorry. Um, is kind of what we expect normals are good, healthy pups. They're gonna have a good chance of surviving. But then on the left-hand side, when it's down at like 0 0.02, you can see that those are all our warm years. 1997, 2014 was part of the heat wave. 2012 is the one exception, which was a very cold year. And we think that that had more to do with um, really high upwelling that transported the food farther offshore. But anyway, I just wanted to kind of show this to you so that you could see that the environment is a really key in terms of how many animals are going to show up on your beaches. And then the causes for that. Well, one of them is hookworm disease, which is endemic. Um, it primarily affects pups. So this would only be probably pups that are born at Año Nuevo might wash up on your beaches because of hookworm. Um, mainly they die because the hookworms suck all of their nutrients out of their intestines and then they eventually lead to anemia and organ failure. Um, this is a density dependent um, parasite. So it only really shows up in big numbers when the populations are really high. So we've been seeing it now pty consistently killing eh, 20, 20% or so of the pups every year as the population has gotten bigger, whereas we didn't see it much at all in the 70s and 80s. One of the other things that you guys are gonna see a lot is adult females that die from domoic acid toxicity or other biotoxins. Um, the main one is pseudonychia, which is um, attacks the nervous system. This is a, also called har harmful algal blooms. That might be what you guys are more familiar with. And up here in the right-hand corner of the slide, I kind of, kind of show one of those events. Um, they're becoming more frequent. We don't fully understand what drives the events, but they do seem to be linked a little bit to warmer water conditions. Um, we can sometimes have as many as 3,000 juvenile and adult females die in a single event, and we're currently having one now. We've lost several hundred adult females um, in Southern California. Um, on average, most of the adult, uh, most of the mortality is for adult females, and these can also have just sublethal doses, which can lead to reproductive failure and kind of recurrent seizures. So if you see animals on your beach that are sort of in a kinked position where their neck is kinked back and they're really stiff, the flippers are kind of pinned against the body, that is a typical animal that has died from a seizure that is often associated with these um, toxic blooms. And then the last disease I'm going to mention is just leptospirosis, which is another one that's very common at Año Nuevo Island. And we've been doing a bunch of studies with some of our colleagues um, looking at the presence of leptospirosis um, at Año Nuevo and up in Washington and then at the islands down south in the Channel Islands. And the majority of it is really prevalent at Año Nuevo and the Northern Islands. It mostly affects adult males and juvenile males. 
Um, it is endemic. It's not a it's not an invasive disease that that wasn't in the population, but it it has this very interesting cycle, and that's what this graph to the left is showing you. It kind of crops up, and we have huge numbers of strandings related to it, and then we don't have any, and then we have a bunch, and then we don't have any. Um, it's a very weird cycle, and we don't fully understand it yet. Um, but what lepto does do is it causes kidney failure, and that almost always results in death. Um, and the transmission is mainly by urine, although it's not completely understood. And one of the reasons that we think Anyo and places like that, those rocky hard substrates um, are primary transmission sites is because the urine has nowhere to go. So the animals are kind of traipsing through each other's urine and, and that puts them at more risk than someplace like San Miguel where it can just kind of seep into the sand. So I'll stop there and see if you guys have any questions about disease before I talk about predation and some other things. Thank you. There was a question about um, how are they um, exposed to hookworm? How do they get that exposure? What's a little bit more about that? And then the other question was about cancer. Ah, okay. So if that you might know what that means. Yeah, those are cool. Uh, hookworm is really an amazing thing. Um, it's a very complicated cycle. Um, generally what happens is females carry the larvae in their milk, in their colostrum actually, so the first milk that they have. Um, and the female itself doesn't have hookworm, it just is a host for the larvae. And when they give the first load of milk to their pup after it's born, it gives them a big, huge swath of these hookworm larvae. And the larvae go in, they move through the system and down into the stomach and then into the intestines where they mature into hookworm. They latch onto the intestine of the pup and then they start sucking nutrients from the intestinal wall. Um, and eventually the pup is shedding that and then they start laying eggs and the pup starts shedding those eggs into the sand as it, uh, as it defecates and then those when they go into the sand, the eggs, they sit in the sand and then they turn into what they call first stage larvae. And the first stage larvae actually bore up through the flippers of animals that are on the beach. And then they move, they migrate through the animal's body into the mammary glands. And then it starts all over again. And so in males, it's a dead end. If a hookworm gets into a male, it doesn't have anywhere to go because there's no mammary glands. Um, but if it gets into a female, then it perpetuates the cycle. And they can have, um, we've seen beautiful big pups, huge, really healthy looking pups, just drop dead on the beach. And it's mainly from this organ failure and really severe anemia that's caused by a heavy load of hookworm. So that's that story. Um, and the, see, see, the second question was about cancer. Um, and we have done a bunch of work with the Rain Mammal Center looking at um, the connection between your genital cancers, which occur in about 20% of California sea lions. It's the highest percentage of cancer in a wild mammal that we know about. Um, and we have linked those to uh, herpivirus, which has also been linked to high contaminant loads. So there appears to be a connection between Animals when they're juveniles having higher levels of contaminants in their system, PCBs and, and to a lesser extent DDT. And then as they mature, herpes is a sexually transmitted disease. So as they mature and they become um, adults and they are exposed to reproduction, then somehow something takes place and there's this um, transformation into uh, a cancer. So we have cancer, both uterine cancer for females and then testicular cancer for males. And we think that that pathway is roughly the same. We still are a little unclear on that transition from sort of the herpes virus and then having the cancer. We don't really quite know um, what's happening there, but we do know that there's a connection between those two. Thank you. That hookworm sounds, <laughs> they all do, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So two more questions. One, I'm just gonna read this to you um, from one of our docents. And she says, I would typically, typically talk to visitors about sea lions as being a boom and bust species, highly dependent on food availability in the great Monterey Bay ecosystem. Seems like that might not be true because I think your chart showed incremental growth that is steady. <laughs> that is steady. Um, seems like that not not be true because I think your chart showed incremental growth that is steady but slowed recently. 
how would you edit that talking point? They are a useful um, thing to talk about when people ask about impacts of climate change. Yeah, That's I don't think, yeah, I would not classify them as boom and bust in the traditional sense. Um, at a place like Anyo, and this is true places like San Francisco Bay, and these we, we call these kind of ephemeral, um, ephemeral haulouts in a way, um, because they are the numbers that you're going to see there are definitely going to vary um, by by year. So you're going to have years at Anyo where your numbers are pretty low. Um, and that is going to be a reflection of the fact that the prey just isn't nearby and they have to be someplace else. What I was showing you earlier on that graph is the whole population. So that's the entire population of sea lions. And we don't really see, we have not seen a boom and bust in the total population numbers. But what you guys are seeing is kind of a localized effect where there are going to be years where we're going to have lots of animals and then there are going to be years where you don't have very many. But that's not a that's not carried out into the total number of the population as a whole. You're still going to have 250,000 sea lions. They're just not going to all be in Monterey Bay. They're going to be, you know, up in San Francisco. They're going to be up in Washington um, if that's where the food is. Monterey Bay is an incredibly productive and really important um, system. And that's part of why they're there. Um, but there are years when for many years, for example, when anchovy were completely gone from that system. And in those years, sea lions didn't really hang around there all that much because there was a, there really wasn't much reason. Um, but when anchovy came back, um, boy, they they set up shop there. Um, so it has a lot to do with the with the location of the prey around the island. And so boom and bust might be a, as long as you kind of edit that so that it so that it doesn't seem like it's the entire population, but rather just kind of a local. Um, maybe maybe you could say something like um, you have a lot of um, uh, variability in the numbers of of animals, and that's tied to the the availability of prey there in Monterey Bay and the surrounding areas. It's also really important, like San Francisco Bay and other areas like that. That whole area there is really really um, important, and it doesn't take a sea line any time at all to move from one to the other. Um, so I would say, yeah, boom and bust just gives the impression that it's the whole population, but maybe try to edit it down to your kind of local, your local area that you have that's driven by that. She says, thank you very much. Uh, last question is uh, a couple people asked about what you know about survival rates for six sea lions that are rescued, rehabilitated, and released. How do they do with that? Are the numbers good, not? And then we'll have you move on to your next section. Okay, um, I'll be honest, I don't know much about that. Um, we do a lot of collaborative work with the Marine Mammal Center and the rehab centers, um, mainly because some of the animals that we mark show up in their rehab centers. Um, and they always let us know when that happens because for my purposes, thinking about a population, they're dead to me. <laughs> they would have died had they not been rescued, right? Um, but what the rehab centers do is they rehab them and then they let me know when they put them back out and then I try to keep track and see if I see those animals again. The challenge is that there aren't very many of those. We only mark um, three to 500 California sea lion pups a year and there are more than 25,000 born. So the proportion is very small and the odds of the ones that we do mark showing up um, in the rehab centers and being picked up alive um, are fairly low. So we don't have very good data on that. Um, that would be a better question for somebody at the, at the Marine Mammal Center or someplace like that. They have constantly asked us for that information because they wanna know too. Um, it's just that we just don't really see enough to be able to say anything really scientifically sound. I think I would say depends a lot of, on the reason why they stranded. So for example, a demolic acid animal is gonna have very low likelihood of surviving out in the wild if it's, if it's returned. You know, they give them, they give them um, some drugs and things to try to help with the seizures, but once they're back out in the wild, we still see animal seizing um, on the island. So I think that would be something where I would say it would probably be really low. Things like a juvenile that just didn't know how to feed and comes in starving, they might have a pretty good chance. You know, if they, if they can fatten them up and, and they actually can, kind of give them an idea of how they're supposed to feed. Sometimes they just need to get over that hump of weaning where you know their mom leaves them and they're trying to figure out what to feed and they don't know how to do it. If you can get them past that first couple of months and get them fattened up so they got a little bit of fat 
um, they can go out and maybe figure it out on their own. So I would say it probably has a lot to do with what caused them to strand in the first place. We do know that entangled animals, which I'll talk about in a moment, they do have actually very high survival um, if they get disentangled from, from netting. And we do that in the wild animals and the Marine Mammal Center and other um, rehab centers do a lot of that disentangling. And those animals have high survival once they get the net off of them. Thank you, that was helpful. We happen to be going on a field trip to the Marine Mammal Center, some of us. Um, so anybody here who's going, let's try and remember to ask them about survival rates. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's an awesome place, so have fun doing that. Uh, all right, so moving on to a few more things that you guys might see. Um, predation. Um, whoa. I don't know what that was. Okay, uh, predation. Um, this is a relatively new thing that we've seen on California sea lions. It's very common with um, elephant seals to see shark bites, but we hadn't traditionally seen them on California sea lions until about 2010. And then we started seeing a lot of them. Um, and several hundred animals a year um, we see with shark bite. And those are only the ones we see. So those are the ones that survived and showed up on the island. Um, they also are of course food for killer whales. And one of the interesting things, we all know about great white sharks, but we also see um, yeah. mako shark bites. And in this picture, it's a little hard to see probably because it's small for you guys. Um, the difference between a great white and a mako bite, if you guys ever see them, a great white has got that classic um, um, semi, semi circle um, shape to it and really jagged kind of um, triangle teeth marks, right? But mako sharks have rakes. So they have teeth more like a, a dog or like a canine from a dog. And so they make a big rake down the side of the animal. And that's what this animal here has on her side. Um, so you can distinguish between the two shark predators just simply by the kind of bite wound that you see on the animal. Um, and we think that the increase in shark attacks has to do with the increase in shark populations um, since they stopped being kind of indiscriminately killed in the 1990s and prior to that. They're now protected through a lot of their areas in California and the numbers have been growing and growing. And we think that the combination of sea lions growing and sharks growing has kind of brought them um, into contact. But we don't think enough of them are dying from that to really kind of regulate the population. But I would imagine you guys might see a few of those, especially because Anya is known um, for having sharks um, circling around the island there. And then the last thing I was gonna mention, which I just touched on was fishery interactions. Um, this would be another thing that you guys might see quite frequently um, as a stranded animal or a dead animal on the beach. Um, we see this a lot um, at the, in the wild population, particularly in the Channel Islands. And we are working really hard with a, a project that we have with the Marine Mammal Center and with our um, NOAA's um, bigger disentanglement group to try to start mitigating a lot of these interactions because we do know that we have incredible success um, if we can just capture them and get the netting cut off, but it would be even better if we can stop the entanglement in the first place. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of gillnet fisheries left anymore in California, but there are still a few and the animals really seem to find them. So um, that's something that we're working really hard. That's a human caused mortality factor that we really should be able to mitigate a little bit better than we have. Um, and it generally affects young animals. Um, they get it when they're young, they're really curious, they're swimming around, they go up into something or they crash into the net. Um, but this image that you have here on the left upper corner is, is a really sad thing to see. And um, we wanna do whatever we can to stop that. Um, and that was really all I was gonna cover because I wanted to have lots of time for questions, but, um, and I'm willing to stay um, for a while. If you guys like to stay and have more questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much. We do have some questions. Um, one is a little bit more about the sagittal crest. I know I've been, I've heard two different things and maybe they're not, or maybe they are compatible. One is that it's there because it indicates great uh, jaw strength but then I wonder why animals with jaw strength don't have the crest. And then others, it's a male characteristic to show size and strength. But any comments on the sagittal crest? I, I've never heard the jaw. Um, I'm not sure how that would work because the muscles for the jaw are not attached to the sagittal crest. Um, I have always, been, I've always learned that it was a secondary sexual characteristic that they developed to show um, sort of their development to females. So it's a 
it is true that you, you don't really see territorial males without a sagittal crest. Um, it's a pretty distinct feature. Um, so I think it has a lot to do with, um, you know, a display characteristic um, to show females that they're, you know, that they are a mature and capable um, male. One of the interesting things about the crest is that because we have animals marked in the population, the development of that is not age specific. So you can have males that are the same age, you can have like three males that are the same age, and one will have a fully developed um, crest and one will look like a female, it'll look like a juvenile, and one will kind of have this little knobby little head that doesn't actually have a crest, but it doesn't have a flat head either. Um, and, and we don't, I don't fully understand what that is, except that I think it must have to do with how well they develop as juveniles and into their adulthood. Like, you know, do they feed really well? Um, maybe they're the more successful males, in which case the crest would definitely indicate to a female that, hey, you know, if you mate with me, your pup is more likely to survive and and create more pups later on. But I, that's just me, you know, guessing. Great, I know there was a question before about if you can just talk a little bit about the stellar sea lion um, and mm. anything you know about if their uh, life cycle breeding, you know, when they might be breeding at Anyo or what they're doing there or anything. Right, um, so stellar, we don't know as much about stellar sea lions for good reason. Um, they're a lot harder to handle and study. Um, but what I can tell you is, is that their breeding system is, is the timing of their pupping and their breeding is very similar to California sea lions. So a lot of the stuff that I was talking about with sea lions is very similar. One of the big differences is that stellar sea lions, females, they only have a single pup, but they, um, they take their pup with them. So they, they stay with their pup for like the first six weeks or so. And they, they do just day trips out from the island. They go out and they feed and then they come back and they nurse their pup. And when the pup is about six weeks old, they begin traveling with it to different haul outs. And generally from Anyo, they're moving northward up to Oregon and Washington. Um, and we think they're doing that because that's where the food is. And so they, they are kind of more, we don't really call them migrators, but they do tend to disperse. Whereas, as I mentioned, California sea lions don't do that. Their pups are not capable of traveling with them. And so that's a very distinct difference between the two. Um, the other part of it is breeding. When I mentioned California sea lions, I said that, that the female gives birth to the pup and then it's 30 days before she's ready to be bred. Stellar sea lions are, are bred eight days after they give birth. So before the female ever goes on her first foraging trip, she is bred by the male where, basically the male where she had her pup in that territory, that's probably the male that's gonna mate with her. Whereas with California sea lions, because it's 30 days, they wander all over the place and they can breed with any male they want. Um, so that's a very big contrast between the two systems. Um, also stellar sea lions are huge. If you guys have seen them, um, they're just absolutely, a, a female stellar sea lion is about the same size as an adult California sea lion. And the males are something like 2000 pounds. They're huge. Um, so they're very big. They're much more aggressive with the females. Um, they, they bite them and they um, are kind of more um, aggressive, whereas California sea lions don't do that kind of thing. They don't hold the females, they don't bite them, they don't um, do any of the stuff that you see with elephant seals or some of these other species. So that's another really distinct difference. In terms of population at Año Nuevo, you guys have the farthest south um, colony of, Calif of stellar sea lions. I think it's roughly about 300 pups a year are born there. Um, it used to, they did traditionally, historically, I should say, they, they bred at San Miguel Island, but the, they disappeared from there in 1982. And we now only see occasionally a male here and there. Um, so you guys have the farthest south breeding colony. Um, and it's also believed that that colony will be one of the huge indicators of climate change because Stellar's, their center of their of their um, breeding range is Alaska. It's the Aleutian Islands and Russia, very cold water, very cold systems. And here they are down off Anya, which is very cold. You know, the water around there, you guys know this, it's really cold, right? Um, but as it warms with climate change, we wouldn't be surprised to see stellars kind of have to move northward. And so one of the things that we are keeping track of is kind of how that colony is doing. It's, it's considered a very sensitive and indicator colony for the population because we think it will contract 
um, as climate change occurs. So those are some of the things I know about them. Um, I don't know much about diseases or other things in stellar sea lions. I don't think anybody does. It's really tough to study them and handle them. Thank you. That helps uh, learning about that. Um, I think uh, we have one last question and it's about, um, it's a comment that it appears that a lot of the disease processes are associated with the exposure to urine. Is this correct? Uh, well, leptospirosis definitely is. The other's really not. Um, Demolk acid and cancer and um, hookworm. Uh, hookworm is more of a feces situation where the feces get into the sand and then the, the larvae kind of develop in the sand and then work their way up through the flippers. Um, so no, I would say leptospirosis is one of the ones that is, but not, not generally the others. I do think that probably infections, you know, if they get bit by a shark or um, they have a lot of wounds, you know, they get hit by propeller, you know, things like that. Um, even their uh, net entanglements, the entanglement itself isn't what kills them. It tends to be the infection. And so I think wallowing around in urine probably isn't so good for that. Um, so I think in that sense, it probably does sometimes aggravate um, some of those processes that are, are, you know, kind of going on. But it isn't actually, other than leptospirosis, that's the only disease I know that is actually linked to, to urine. Thank you. Um, I'm just amazed looking, I wrote some of the different notes and just the difference. I think sometimes we lump all marine mammals or pinnipeds together and the fact that the males are kind to the pups or, or even notice the pups kind of fascinated me and uh, how long they're weaned, it's pretty amazing. So thank you. Um, I know we've all been very curious about these animals for a while. So. It looks like we don't have any more questions. So uh, uh, again, thank you so much, Sharon. I really appreciate you putting this together. We um, really love when I send out the recording to also be able to send out um, maybe a PDF of your slides or something. If you have a possibility to save yours as a PDF and send it over, that would be fantastic. And then I will send that out um, when uh, I send out the recording. So. Thank you for coming in. So thank you very much for a wonderful program. Sure. Thank you. I'm happy to do it. And yeah, I can send those out to you. And um, thanks for inviting me. It was really fun. I love, um, I love getting questions and talking about sea lions. So thanks for the opportunity. We love asking. So all right, everybody. <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording. And